This is Business Weekend with Ross Greenwood. Hi there and welcome to Business Weekend. I'm Ross Greenwood. Thanks for being with us today. Coming up on the program, the Reserve Bank seems to have very few options but to resume raising interest rates again. But is it a case of repeating past mistakes? In other words, increasing rates at the very time when economic hurt means rates should actually be cut. We analyse the next moves today. And if there is a material change, they will act on the back of that. So we do expect them to hike the rate 25 basis points. The government this week doubled its support for the critical minerals industry as Prime Minister Anthony Albanese cozied up to the US President to gain greater access to the tens of billions of dollars of subsidies in its Inflation Reduction Act. It could change the economics for the local mining industry. Do we keep it for ourselves? And I call it the dog on the bone. It's, it's my bone, I'm going to bury it, nobody else is going to have it, but what are you going to do with it? And as the world goes digital and at-home entertainment has never been bigger or better, the irony is that demand for live events, concerts, cinema and sport have never been greater. Just ask the global boss of cinema giant IMAX, Richard Gelfond, as he this week reopened its Sydney theatre after a seven-year wait. In Ecuador, we have nine. In Australia, we have two. In London, we have 50. In Japan, we have 40. So all that and plenty more coming up on today's program. Don't miss that interview. It's a beauty. Anyway, let's start the program with this week's inflation rate, which did come in higher than expected. For most economists, it was the last piece in the puzzle about what the Reserve Bank will do next with interest rates. From those economists, the picture is now clear. Rate rises must recommence. Edward Boyd starts our coverage. Without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, the new Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia, Michelle Bullock. On Tuesday, Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock spoke for the first time since being promoted to the new job. She was clearly determined to send a strong message about the RBA's willingness to fight inflation. Economists call it hawkish. The board won't hesitate to raise the cash rate further if there's a material upward revision to the outlook for inflation. We're going to reconsider the outlook for the economy in the light of incoming information. The problem was, the next day, inflation surprised to the upside, 5.4%. The market expected less. It prompted most economists to immediately change their economic forecasts. After previously saying the cash rate would be on hold in November, now, almost everyone said the RBA will hike on Melbourne Cup Day. CBA wrote, CPI stronger than expected, RBA to hike the cash rate in November. ANZ said, RBA to hike in November, Q3 CPI too high to risk holding. And NAB was the strongest in their analysis, saying RBA to hike in November with risk of another. Markets are pricing about 38 points of, uh, if you like, so one and a half rate rises, our view would be it's more likely unless inflation stays even higher than what we expect, that they'll do one and then sit there and watch. And probably what will happen is that you won't now see rate cuts until the back end of the year rather than the middle of the year. So higher for longer, if I can put it that way. But one person didn't see it that way. Treasurer Jim Chalmers downplayed the stubbornly high inflation number. He said markets can be wrong that he couldn't talk for the Reserve Bank, but we shouldn't assume rate rises. It's really important to recognise uh, that the uh, annual inflation number that we have received today uh, is in line with expectations. Uh, it's in line with uh, the Treasury forecasts in the most recent budget. Uh, and it doesn't materially change, it doesn't change uh, the Treasury's expectations for when uh, inflation will return to the target band. Chalmers, it was clear, was seeking to talk the market around. So how would Bullock react? The next morning, she fronted Senate estimates in Canberra and was asked multiple times about inflation. Every one of her answers was circumspect. Not that she would ever give too much away, but the inflation-fighting hawk from two days earlier now seemed more dovish. The um, print came out a little higher than we'd been forecasting at our uh, August statement on monetary policy, but it was pretty much where we thought it would come out, given the information we'd um, 
come into since then, particularly the monthly CPI indicator. So we, we thought it was going to be about where, where it came out. Inflation is higher than the RBA's forecasts due to higher fuel prices and sticky services costs. But Bullock could not be drawn about where the rates will rise. I'd say we're still analysing um, the numbers at the moment. I wouldn't like to say more or less likely. We're still, we're still looking at it. Um, it has confirmed what we've been saying all along, as I said, that the persistence is in the services side and the good side is responding. But I think that's all I'd say at this point. All I was trying to convey really um, was the same thing we've been conveying all along, which is the longer that inflation remains outside the target band, um, the more likely it is that inflation expectations might adjust to that. After her Senate appearance, Bullock's old colleague Lucy Ellis, the former head of economics at the RBA, emerged and said rates will need to rise. Ellis joined Westpac as a chief economist three weeks ago. Until this week, she's been silent on the direction of rates. So her research note is a critical signal from someone who knows the RBA and its monetary policy board so intimately. Ellis wrote, having spelled out so clearly that a material surprise to the outlook would warrant a rate increase, she simply had to be equivocal to avoid front-running the board's decision, which is still more than a week away. An increase in November won't be the outcome the RBA had hoped for, but given the strength of their rhetoric around upside surprises, I don't think they will try to craft a rates-on-hold story, nor will they wait until the following month. On Thursday, the ASX rate tracker was pricing in a 55% chance of a rate increase next month. But on Friday, shifted down to 47% after Bullock's comments in the Senate. The key factor influencing rates is trimmed mean inflation. It remains elevated at 5.2%, too high for comfort, perhaps. Prices for petrol, rents, electricity, gas and takeaway food were all higher than the previous quarter. Some of those are expected to still be rising now. Uh, what the Reserve Bank looks at is the trim mean. So they sort of trim away the bottom 15% of price falls, take away the top 15% and look at the average. Now, the Reserve Bank was expecting 0.9 in the quarter and they got 1.2. So you, you never know exactly what the Reserve's going to do, but they've said, essentially, that if they got a surprise on the upside on inflation, they would essentially react to it. But as politics crashed into the monetary policy debate this week, Shadow Treasurer Angus Taylor was more direct. Australians are feeling the pain from these price rises. So in the last quarter alone, a 1.2% increase. Uh, that's well above what it was in the previous quarter, 08 and well above expectations. And of course, that increases the probability of a Reserve Bank uh, interest rate increase in the future. The next RBA board meeting is on Melbourne Cup Day. This week's information makes it clear the meeting is live. Rates could rise again. Well, the wild card for our economy right now is the Aussie consumer and their spending resilience in the face of rising prices and interest rates. And already there are warning signs. Supermarket grocery basket sizes, they're lower. JB Hi-Fi's quarterly sales, they were down this week. Four-wheel drive accessories company ARB says its business is falling. But in the US in the past quarter, consumer spending drove its economy to a surprising high of 4.9%. And all this plays into the Reserve Bank's decisions. Well, this week I spoke with Michaelia Ficillo, Head of Australia and New Zealand Economics at Bank of America, about the resilience of Australian consumers. Uh, we have an inbuilt measure of household spending, which looks at what the consumer is going to be in the next quarter. And this is the first time that index actually has dropped into the negative level. So um, the ABS data is actually showing that um, consumption is at the same levels that we have seen during the pandemic when the economy was in lockdown. Um, if, you, if you take into account the amount of population growth that we had in the last year, it's actually extremely weak consumption. Uh, measures of dis discretionary spending and essential spending are both declining, suggesting they're really, really feeling the interest rate rises as well as the inflation. So the RBA has really this very difficult balancing act between controlling inflation and also making sure that consumers can get through um, the end of the year, at least. OK, so we can see your chart here. And what it's really showing us in many ways is that there has just been a significant drop-off, which means that the rise in interest rates from the Reserve Bank's point of view has actually done its job. Yes, yes, I, I would agree with that. We're also going through 
what we call the mortgage cliff, which is all these fixed mortgages are actually starting to expire. And a lot of people who were on rates around 2 to 3%, they're going to see large increases. Those consumers, based on RBA research, are more prepared for the hikes than those who were on, on variable rates. But still means that there's a little bit more to go on the consumer side of things. Um, our team, uh, our banking team, is estimating that the peak of um, um, schedule expiry of those mortgages is December. So the, the last quarter as we head into Christmas is probably going to look uh, like what the chart is. is and that's also the same quarter, if we think about where we are right now, given what's happening in the Middle East, that fuel prices are also much higher. Yeah. So you've got energy prices at home, you've got fuel prices, you've got ongoing increases in the cost of housing. Yes. Uh, and, and then on top of that, you've still got the potential of at least another interest rate rise. Is it actually necessary, do you think? I, I was the idea initially that it wasn't necessary, that the RBA has done enough. But looking at the composition of inflation yesterday, it's actually, it seems like the right thing to do. So core inflation measures that actually exclude all these volatile items that you, that you mentioned are showing that inflation is still really strong at that level. The RBA has a forecast. They are expecting inflation to, to reach 4.1 by the end of the year. It's not looking very likely. Uh, they have expressed consistently that they will change their forecast and if there is a material change, they will act on the back of that. So we do expect them to hike the rate 25 basis points. Uh, there's two things about it. We don't think there's any more scope to continue hikes. So they will have to really live with inflation about target for a bit longer. They think they will reach the target back at the end of 2025. We think that's achievable. But at the same time, the consumer is a bit concerned. Um, consumers are continuing to be very weak and they really can't handle any more. Yeah, we can see the hikes. inflationary aspects here. And the real problem here, as I can see it, is when you look at um, transport, health, recreation and housing. These are things that people can't avoid. Uh, and yet those prices still continue to be stubbornly high and rising. Uh, and, and that gives the sense, which even Michelle Bullock has spoken about in the past week or so, about the sticky inflation. The fact that it's yeah. really not, uh, as sometimes the Treasurer says, imported inflation through goods prices. This is now going to the services industry. Yeah, so um, the, the transport part, it is, is petrol prices mostly, and also travel, domestic travel, it's been impacted by all of those. All of these are also inputs into companies' prices as well. Electricity going up, services in the household sector. Um, the services side of things is, is different. It's more driven by demand. So demand for consumers is, is slowing. So you would expect that that services is, is going to start to come down as the economy and demand slows. Um, the, the last quarter data actually so showed a decrease in, um, in services, but it was actually driven by childcare fees. That was impacted by a policy from the government where the childcare fees actually declined. Other than that, the services side is still really sticky and rents is probably one of the main drivers there um, recording ongoing increases. And I, OK, so there's one other aspect of this, and that is, you know, you know what the thinking of the Reserve Bank Board will be? There's history whereby central banks, Australia in Australia particularly, have one or two interest rate rises that they probably in hindsight should not have had. They literally keep raising rates when really the argument is they should have been cutting rates. They're trying to get that balancing act just right to keep yeah. more people in jobs. That's the psychology of it. But the numbers, the pure numbers right now, are saying you don't have much choice. You've probably got to keep on raising those rates. Yeah, I guess the RBA has tried so far to keep that balance between employment growth positive, uh, supporting jobs and also supporting um, inflation and avoiding a um, much larger increase in inflation expectation. Those are things that are really hurtful for incomes in the housing, household sector. What, what happens there is um, that now the consumer is on the edge. So this extra hike is probably uh, more likely to push the consumer a little bit further. And we might not be able to avoid that soft landing that people are talking about. The financial stability review from the RBA show that the consumer is quite resilient. They are making the payments on their mortgages. They, they're getting by. Home prices are going up. Home prices are going up. So that means uh, the asset values are OK. It means that if you believe in wealth effect, consumer sentiment should probably increase. But it also creates more demand for housing on the investor perspective, considering rents are going up as well. So, so tell me one thing. When we look back in history, Michaela, do you think that the Reserve Bank will be compared with its peers overseas, many of which went much harder with interest rates than what they did here in Australia? And we know what that delicate balancing act that they're trying to achieve. But in hindsight, do you think they'll be judged well for that approach 
as compared with, say, New Zealand, which has gone much harder, hurt their economy, you could argue, more quickly. The United States, gone much harder, now showing signs of it turning around. The UK, a basket case, gone much harder as well. How do you reckon they'll be judged? I think uh, Australia has um, significantly different idiosyncratic factors. So the Australian consumer is highly leveraged, is one of the most leveraged in, in the world because of housing. So more sensitive to interest rate moves? Yes. The second thing is um, the, the mortgage sector is a variable rate sector mostly. In the US, mortgages are 30-year 30, 30 fixed. So even if you hike the rate, you're not really hurting um, consumers as much as you do here. That means the transmission is probably um, faster in Australia than it is elsewhere. Uh, the New Zealand case is different because the economy is a little bit less diverse as Australia. So they're more um, the, the reaction function is different from the central bank. And also income growth was a lot hi higher than it is here. We haven't really seen the peak on wages growth domestically, whereas in New Zealand, we saw wages actually catching up with inflation. So um, if, if, I, if I take the economy at face value, you could, you could think now the RBA probably hasn't done enough to control inflation, but the drivers of inflation are really things you can't control with interest rates rises. So um, I get and I, I can understand why they'll focus more on the consumer and the labour market, considering that they can't control oil prices by hiking rates. They oh. can't control rent prices by hiking rates. So these things, there's, there's a lot of more factors going on there. So, yeah, I think I, I, in hindsight, um, we don't think there's more scope to go beyond that 4.35 in November. I'll tell you what, Michaela Fichula, it's good to have you on the program. Thank I really you. appreciate your time and we'll do it again shortly. Thank you. Well, coming up after the break, I sit down with the global boss of cinema giant IMAX and we watch a little Oppenheimer as he explains why Australia should have 40 IMAX cinemas and not just two. It is good to have your company with us here on Business Weekend. Well, Richard Gelfond is a movie industry legend, an Academy Award winner. His company bought out IMAX back in 1994, and since then, he's been its chairman or chief executive. In Australia, there are just two IMAX cinemas in Melbourne, and after seven long years, it includes COVID and a builder going broke, IMAX this week relaunched in Sydney. I sat down with Gelfond in the new cinema and asked if he's confident about the demand for IMAX in Australia. Um, that's an understatement, Ross. Um, the numbers are spectacular. Since it opened two weeks ago, it's the number one IMAX theatre in the world over that period of time. And remember, we have over 1,700 theatres in 90 countries. There's an enormous demand here. And when I landed here, um, it, when I said I was with IMAX, it was incredible. I don't, I've never gotten a reaction like that anywhere else in the world. People really are craving it. Okay, so it's about the content and what you've got is more movie makers now prepared to shoot in the IMAX format to get them into these cinemas. But you know, it's not as though these are the, the most numbers of cinemas in the world, but it's the quality that they seem to be looking, looking for. I think it's a combination of the movie and I also think it's the experience. Um, people really want to get off their couches. They want to leave their homes. They're tired of the pandemic era. I think maybe they're tired of their families and watching, you know, doing everything on the couch. And it's really a global trend where our numbers for IMAX, our market share in North America is up 50% since pre-pandemic. And our market share globally is up 40% since pre-pandemic. And yes, it has a lot to do with the movies, but I think it also has a lot to do with people wanting something special. I mean, I don't care how much money you have, you can't get this in your house. You certainly can't get it in your house, but it's to be fair that the at-home entertainment experience is much better than it's ever been. And yet notwithstanding that, the people are still prepared to get up and have an outside experience. Yeah, I think they're different. I think they could exist side by side. I think the in-home entertainment experience for episodic TV, the streaming, I think that all really works. But when I think when it comes to movies and when it comes to special effects and when it comes to sound, but maybe the most important thing is the communal nature of it. I think for a big 
spectacle kind of thing. People want to see it, not only with their friends, but strangers. So when there's a big movie, I think they want to laugh together, they want to cry together, they want to clap together. And I think they really miss that. And I think people miss that whole cultural implication. During the pandemic, a lot of um, predictors said, oh, movies are never going to come back. And I was sort of proselytizing that, you know, back in Pompeii, there were theaters, right? In Shakespeare's time, there were theaters. I didn't think like a virus for a few months was going to change the human race that much. And I think it's proven to be true. People really want to be with other people and they want to experience things that they can't do at home. Okay, so IMAX has two cinemas now in Australia, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne. What sort of population base do you need to justify the investment in a cinema of this scale? So, well, this scale is really unique, let's be clear this is one of the biggest screens in the world this is this is a, a really special project but usually we have um, uh, we divide a country into zones and we divide them up and it's not that scientific because obviously some zones a river runs through the middle or a mountain range or whatever but we think that Australia could have 40 theaters hang on 40 think, you've got two now 40 yeah, it's it's driving me crazy Ross I don't understand it uh, you know in, in Ecuador we have nine in Australia, we have two. In London, we have 50. In Japan, we have 40. Um, this, one of the reasons I came here is not only to open this theater, which I'm incredibly excited about, but I'm gonna meet with some Australian exhibitors and say, what's wrong with you guys? I mean, can't you, don't they like money here in Australia? Because, but then would, the cinemas obviously would not be of this scale, but then quite clearly you could put them into suburban areas, put them a, 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 alongside shopping centres, a range of different things as to where you could actually place these I, IMAX cinemas. So to give you like a crazy example is China has 800 IMAX theatres and it has 200 more in backlog. So that's a thousand IMAX theaters. Again, we'll go back to Australia having two. I mean, I know it's a big country, but there are a lot of zones and a lot of places it could be. And, and I think it has something to do um, with the mindset of the exhibition group in that particular country. So people always say, you know, well, it works in these six countries, but I'm not sure it's gonna work in my country. And inevitably, I haven't found a country um, where it doesn't work. We're doing great in New Zealand. We just, we opened a theater in Wellington and part of the reason we opened it there was because Jim Cameron was making the avatars and we thought having a theater nearby would be a great thing. And event opened it with us up there. And um, in less than a year, they've done about a million and a half US dollars already. So, so this is something which is going to grow because you know, you've also, as I say, got the stock of films and entertainment to come into these cinemas that people might not have seen, especially in Sydney where it hasn't been here for seven years. So you've got this whole, you know, sort of backlog, if you like, of, of movies, plus a whole bunch more coming out. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine that people in Sydney haven't seen Top Gun and IMAX. It's a different movie. It was partly filmed with IMAX cameras. We invented cameras that went in the nose cone of it. And it, it, it like in regular cinema, the top and bottom are cut off. You can't see this, the full spectrum. So yeah, I think people are going to really like it when they get to see things that, um, they haven't been able to see. Uh, you know, Avatar 2, it again was almost as, I think it was bigger for us than Avatar 1. Seeing that in 3D was incredible. So I, you know, I, one, one of the things I love to do is come to new cinemas where they haven't seen it because you just watch the people's faces and um, which is what I do a lot of times when I come in and especially kids who have never really experienced it before. I think they're like, wow, I've been missing out on this. Yeah, no, so the, the importance of people like James Cameron or Christopher Nolan, Oppenheimer, film with IMAX uh, technology as well, their credibility actually means that other movie makers will also be enticed to try and make movies in, in this genre. Well, one of the things that we find is we really over-index in IMAX when um, some of these movies are shot. Um, so, for example, in Oppenheimer, we did 20% of the world's box office on eight-tenths of 1% of the screens. And it's, for a lot of those films like that, um, there's no question. There's been, you know, the, you name some of the directors that are using it, but some new ones like Kerry Fuganaka shot part of um, James Bond in IMAX and uh, Jordan Peele 
did nope in IMAX using IMAX cameras, and even Greta Gerwig, um, after Barbie was released, uh, Warner and she came to us and said, wow, I'd love to see how Barbie would look in IMAX. So we re-released Barbie in IMAX. So the world's great filmmakers really want to paint on this canvas. I'll tell you what, Rich Girlfriend, is a great chat. We could go on for hours on this, but I've got to wrap it up here. Many thanks for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this week, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese in the US announced a plan to double to $4 billion the government support for the critical mineral sector. Specifically, the Prime Minister wants Australia's industry to go up the value chain, as they call it, into more production, where there's more money. But is this realistic, given the scale required to actually make real money out of these key areas? Julian Kettle is the Vice Chairman of Metals and mining at Wood Mackenzie, who's in Australia at the moment, and he joins me now. Julia, many thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, I wonder whether the, the extra $2 billion that the government's throwing at this, whether it's throwing money at a, at a train that's already disappeared from the station. Well, well, partly it has, because China's been doing this for well over a decade. It, through trial and error, it's got to a position of dominance. Up the value chain, the one bit it can't change is, is mining. You can't change what's in the ground. And the reality is we need to spend something like a trillion dollars to get on the Paris Align pathway by 2030. So $4 billion is a bit of a drop in the ocean. And the key question is, are you actually going to do this to make money or are you going to do it for strategic reasons? OK, so then let's go back to, are you going to do it to make money? The reality is that Australia has some of the biggest lithium deposits and mines in the world right now most of which has either been sold to Tesla or been sold to China. We have some processing here in Australia at Kwinana and Western Australia and other different bits and pieces, but really, in many ways, you point out, all of the process is being, uh, processing is being done in China. The question is, is it Australia's place to try and play catch-up there? If it's strategic, maybe it is. But if you compare and contrast China, lithium refinery takes 18 months to build, $250 million... Out West, it'll cost you $1.6, $1.5 billion, and it'll take you six years. So, so... So the mathematics there tells me what, as an lay person, I know which decision I'm going to make. Yes, but you then get into politics because we want to wean ourselves off, off China, and if, if it is the strategic driver, then you, it is something you have to do. Now, what that means is it's going to cost more money, and ultimately we, the consumer, are going to have to pay for it. OK, so I'll give you a parallel. Australia um, really has very small uh, fuel uh, production. We, have, we don't have the oil refineries that we once did because it was cheaper and better to go to where there's scale in Singapore and we import the petrol, right? So, therefore, we're beholden to it. Is it exactly the same in lithium and other critical minerals? We might have it in the ground here, but in actual fact, it's just too expensive to process it here, as you're saying. Yeah, and that, and that has been a, um, a, a challenge for Australia as capital costs go up, labour costs go up. It is more expensive to process here. Part of it is down to energy, energy prices, but generally it is far more expensive. So the key question is, are you going to locate processing industry here? Are you going to locate it in Europe? Are you going to get lo located in, in the US? Now, the reality is, the old adage, the closer you get to the ground, the more money there is to be made. What's Australia got I call Australia Treasure Island. It's got the bauxite, it's got the iron ore, it's got the lithium, it's got some rare earth, it's got some copper. So focus on what you're good at. OK, so message. already there is processing uh, for copper in Australia, although even, say, BHP is considering whether it should go ahead with its expansion of Olympic Dam on the basis that, well, there's copper to be found in other parts of the world, could we process it cheaper there? So this is where Australians perhaps don't quite understand that there is actually an economic conversation that's got to be had if you can't provide the cheap energy to process these minerals and metals. There is that, and there's the, the, the general labour market. We know that it's a very, very tight labour market in Australia. That means costs go up. And companies have choices. So if you think about some of the majors, without mentioning names, they have an ability to, to, to transact on one project, maybe two projects. And so then they have a choice. Where do they actually pull the, the trigger on a project? And you get the concept of the level playing field. If they're going to make more money, so driven by their investors, in a country other than Australia, that's where they're going to choose to locate. 
it comes down to economics. And globalisation, because these are global organisations that can actually, you know, have a, have a mine in Canada. And copper is one of the classics of that. But then they could do it in Australia. But you're right that many of the deposits are here. Is it a case where Australia should try to concentrate, to narrow its focus and maybe say, well, lithium is gone. Maybe we've got to do, I don't know, nickel, or maybe we've got to do tantalum or something like that. And maybe it's other um, uh, rare earths that we've got to start to look to process in that really could drive us up that value chain. Well, what I'd say is that when you start thinking about the Critical Minerals Partnership, the Five Eyes and, and others, there needs to be a conversation where, OK, where, where are the natural strengths? It may be that Australia provides the raw materials and the processing is carried out elsewhere. But if we're all working in partnership, we're all working towards the same goal. We can't have this position that we've had perhaps for the last two or three decades where everyone has tried to do everything, even though they don't have natural advantages. All right. So then can I take you to one other aspect? Australia and its energy markets on the East Coast have been in a terrible mess over the past few years. Energy shortages. And part of this is actually put down to the lack of a gas reservation for the domestic industry and for the local economy. Right now, should have Australia at some point in the past had some sort of reservation over lithium to make certain that some of that lithium that we have in, 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 in a surplus, we've got so much of it in Western Australia in particular, that we should have held some of that for our own use and not simply just sold it overseas? I mean, that is a problem that countries that are endowed with, 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 with rich resources always come across. So do we keep it for ourselves? And I call it the dog on the bone. It's, it's my bone, I'm going to bury it, nobody else is going to have it, but what are you going to do with it? You need to add value to it, you need to actually um, develop it. And so the challenge has been development, so you then get into a conversation about whether you've got restrictions on developing mine supply, and there have been restrictions. Those restrictions are getting more onerous because of all the right reasons, ESG concerns, Indigenous rights, etc. What it means is that either because the restrictions are too great or the costs are too great, just the challenges in Australia have become extreme. So therefore, companies say, well, we've got a choice. We either develop in Australia or we look elsewhere. Again, when we get to the politics, our strategic objectives, I think the game has changed. We talk about critical minerals. Now, not all of them are critical. You can't have 60, 70, 80 critical. As they say, when everything's special, no, nothing's special. So some of them are critical. If they're critical, you have to supply them at any cost. That's when you say, OK, We've got lithium resources in Australia. Do we, as Australia Inc., want to develop the whole lithium value chain irrespective of the finances? And that is going to be the big test for Australia, for government, and indeed for the community of taxpayers who would have to fund something like that as well. Julian Kettle, many thanks for your time, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up after the break, another global legend, Cal Henderson, co-created a business that was sold to Salesforce several years ago for 27.7 billion US dollars. That business is all about making work from home a more seamless experience. Cal Henderson is coming up next. Thanks for being with us here on Business Weekend. Look, in tech circles, Cal Henderson is something of a legend. He was one of the founders of the photo sharing app Flickr that was sold to Yahoo. Then he moved his attention to a program that allows teams of workers to communicate and to share projects and tasks. Now that business, of which he's the co-creator and chief technology officer, is called Slack. Astonishingly, Salesforce bought Slack back in 2020 for 27.7 billion US dollars. I recently caught up with Cal Henderson and spoke to him about the trend of working from home that justified that massive sale price. I think it was a really interesting turning point and or really an acceleration point. I think what we saw happen with, with COVID and everybody having to work um, from home overnight really accelerated changes in the workplace that were already happening, already driving towards kind of more flexibility and a different relationship to work. Um, if COVID had happened a decade or 15 years before, I think the outcomes would have been very different. But I think we were already poised 
to see a lot of changes in how people worked anyway. Um, you know, as there is always a, a new generation entering the workplace, there's always this change in people's relationship to work. You know, if you look at how people relate to their jobs and their employers now versus 20 years ago or 40 years ago, it's really significantly different. Some of that is technology change and the actual activities we do at work, and a lot of it is kind of more societal and uh, people's kind of relationship to work as well. But isn't it astonishing, you even think about that COVID period, had we not had high-speed broadband, had we not had programs such as yours, Slack, to allow communications between teams, had we not had Zoom meetings and other types of technology, there would have been wholesale unemployment. Right now, we've got super-duper full employment in the United States, in Australia and other parts of the world, and that's the fundamental economic outcome of having these types of tools. Absolutely. I think it would have been a very different and much worse outcome if this had happened before we had these kinds of tools. Now, if you'd have asked me or, or most business leaders a week before it happened, will you be capable of moving your whole entire organization to working from home over a weekend? Everybody would have said no, that it's not possible, that we couldn't possibly be productive. Um, but it turns out we were wrong. Uh, it was possible to do that kind of change basically overnight. And companies not just continued, but in many kinds of knowledge worker companies, they really thrived during that period. And, you know, I think if, if that period of working from home had just been a couple of weeks or maybe even a couple of months, then it's possible we would have snapped back to how we were before. And we would have just seen it as an anomaly. But instead, it lasted for so long that it has had an undeniable impact on how people think about what's possible in the workplace. It's not just the employers, you know, who, who know that it's possible. It's all of the employees, too. And as an employee, if you work for an organization, you know not just it's possible to do your job from home, but that that was also a period of huge productivity and success for organizations, then why are you going into the office five days a week? Why are you spending so much time commuting? And now we're in this kind of post-pandemic period. We do see some organizations on either end of the spectrum. You know, you have organizations that have brought everybody back to the office every day, five days a week. We're kind of back to how it was five years ago. On the other end of the spectrum, you have some organizations who have said, we don't need an office anymore. Everybody can work from home. We know that it's possible to work in this kind of way. But the majority of organizations of all kinds of sizes of information workers worldwide um, sit somewhere in the middle. There's some form of hybrid. People might be in the office almost every day, but they have some flexibility, or they might be in the office almost never. Um, but the office is still a tool for people to be able to get together. You know, even a fully distributed organization is not the same as saying, we'll never get together in person. I think that's important too. I think, you know, back when, before the pandemic, it was the default for people to be in an office every day. That was just the assumption that that's what needed to happen for people to get work done and be productive. And I think what's changed now is that we can look at each kind of activity, each kind of thing that somebody does as part of their job and understand what is best done in person and what can be done at home. And in fact, what is best done at home? And what are the activities that need to bring people together? And what are the activities that need a lot of focus? Um, and I think that's just a conversation we couldn't have before the pandemic. OK, but there's also structural change that comes. There's obviously software programs such as yours with all the various apps that allow the instant communication and the sharing of information using technology. But then there's another structural change, even to the price of office blocks in San Francisco or Sydney or wherever it might be. They've fundamentally had the change as a result of this change of behaviour in corporations and individuals. Absolutely. But also that's the only thing that changes, you know, the, the layout and the use of cities over time anyway, is what people do uh, and especially what they do at work, you know, and work and the structure around it has shaped our cities, you know, for the last hundred years. And I think this, you know, while this is a more of an abrupt change that we would have otherwise have seen, I think it is really an acceleration of what was already happening. Now, obviously, when a fast acceleration happens like this, uh, you know, just kind of overnight, it has a huge impact on commercial real estate. You know, what is a downtown of a city for anymore? Um, and I think those 
those questions are things that are going to take months and years to answer as we come to grips with it. You know, as cities see less people coming in every day, what does that mean? But also, what does it mean for the neighbourhoods they live in, uh, where they spend more time every day? And it is going to be a shift in how we think about the role of the, you know, the role of the office and the role of the home. Um, but I think this kind of change is inevitable. It's just been an acceleration of what was already coming. But you personally have been involved in some startups such as Flickr along the way. But then as you came um, in, in, into this business, to have actually got a, a billion dollars in startup capital, you kind of get that. But to then see this enormous change in the workplace, to see this business valued by Salesforce at $27.7 billion just a couple of years ago, that says something about the change in work practices and those who create the tools that's helped to implement it. Yes, I think, you know, as work has changed for information workers over the last decade, it has generally become more complicated, that more work is highly collaborative, uh, that involves teams of people working together. And the hardest challenge for many kinds of organizations, regardless of what it is they do, um, is that that collaboration, getting people aligned, getting them working together towards a goal is a really difficult thing. And tools that help align teams and drive them forward, whatever it is they do, tools like Slack, uh, play an increasingly important role in the modern world of work. I'll tell you what, it is great to have a chat to you. The CTO and founder of Slack, Carl Henderson, many thanks for your time here on the program today. Thanks so much for having me. Now, to the end of August, more than 413,000 overseas migrants arrived in Australia. So any suggestion that only half a million new arrivals will turn up this year, well, that's fanciful. It will be much, much greater than that. So far, the workforce has clearly accommodated these people. But the housing market, well, it's showing some signs of stress as rents rise and home prices increase despite 12 interest rate rises. Cameron Kusher is the Executive Director of Economic Research at REA Group and joins me now. Cameron, always good to chat to you. Um, there's the interesting thing. Half a million already. It could end up being close to 600,000. You've got the same number expected to come in next year. At some point, there's real issues in terms of the housing and accommodation for these people. There certainly is, Ross, and I think we're already at that point. Um, most of the people that come into the country don't own a home. Uh, most of the people that migrate to Australia are temporary, uh, temporarily here. Students, uh, in fact, that are here for up to five years while they study. So if you're only here on a temporary visa, you're probably not going to look to buy a home but you are going to spend a number of years in the rental market. And this is really exacerbating the challenges we're seeing in the rental market at the moment. We've had that household size shrink uh, through the pandemic. Um, we've had now more people coming into the country wanting to rent and wanting to rent for a longer period of time. We've also had more people that own investment properties exiting the market. So it's shrinking the overall pool of rental stock. And to cap that all off, we're seeing a low volume of new dwelling approvals and commencements. So we're not getting the supply response we really need. So it's exacerbating the challenges in the rental market. And longer term, it's going to exacerbate the challenges in the established market too, because at some point, some of these people that have come in from overseas are going to want to stay and they're going to want to buy their own property. And there's not going to be anywhere near enough stock available for them to purchase. So that causes another dilemma for the government, which obviously has this plan for 1.2 million homes over the next five years. But on top of it, it also creates a, a problem for the Reserve Bank because while you've got home prices rising, it's very, very hard at that point um, to really start to cut interest rates anytime soon. That's right. I mean, I'm expecting, given the inflation number we saw last week, that we will st we will see a uh, increase in uh, in interest rates when the RBA board meets in November. Uh, inflation certainly coming down, but not at the pace that they are anticipating. And I think most other people have moved to that same view. Um, but in terms of the prospects of interest rate cuts, well, yeah, I think they're getting pushed out even further and further now because the uh, all these people we're adding into the economy is adding to demand. I think most people were anticipating that property prices would fall this year. We certainly were. And, uh, and they're continuing to grind higher. And the cost of renting is continuing to increase as well because we're not building anywhere near enough housing. And 
Yes, it's great that we've got this goal to build 1.2 million homes over the, in the coming five financial years, but the prospect of doing that, I think, is uh, it, it looks very unlikely to me. OK, then there's another truism of property in property markets, and that is where the population goes, the prices will move up the fastest. So where are these people going to? Because there's not just the new migration coming in from outside of Australia, it's also the interstate migration which becomes really instructive in terms of the future of property prices in individual markets. It certainly does. So most of the people that arrive in Australia arrive in New South Wales and Victoria, and you can imagine most of that is in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, but, you know, you look at the other states and territories, so the most recent quarterly demographic data Queensland saw its highest rate of net overseas migration on record, uh, as did South Australia, and WA's right up there close to a record high as well. So you've got a record high number of people arriving from overseas. If we look at interstate migration, Queensland and WA are the big benefactors of that. So as more and more people come into Sydney and Melbourne, people that are already there move out to other areas and, and Queensland, largely southeast Queensland, and, and WA, largely Perth, is where those people push to. But you also get the people that stay in the same state, but they move out of Sydney, maybe move to Wollongong, uh, move up to Newcastle or somewhere else. And even people in Melbourne that get squeezed out of that market and maybe move to Ballarat or Geelong or places like that. So there's all of these fundamentals that are, that are taking place. I do think as we start to get more up-to-date data on migration trends, we'll start to see positive net interstate migration into Victoria again. It's very close to being positive on the latest data. And I think that comes down to housing affordability. Yes, Melbourne's expensive compared to other capital cities in the country, but it is significantly cheaper than Sydney. And I think when people have the choice of whether to move to Sydney or Melbourne, uh, I think people will preference Melbourne because they'll feel like a, rents are a lot cheaper. You're looking at a median rent in Melbourne of $500 a week as opposed to $650 a week in Sydney. But also, if you're going to stay there and buy a property, buying a property in Melbourne is much cheaper than it is buying a property in Sydney. So, Kim, there's one other thing that strikes me about this, and that is, while a lot of people might be going to south-east Queensland or maybe to parts of Victoria, it's also the infrastructure, which is government responsibility, that has to be built to keep up with this population. That, that's a real challenge too. Like, as you say, when you're adding all these people to the country and to parts of the country, you need to build the infrastructure and the housing to support them. And the challenge we've got, particularly in a lot of the major capital cities at the moment, is there's so much infrastructure construction going on that it's actually taking away the people that need to build the houses that we need to build to cater to this growing population. Cam, of course, you're always great to have you on the program. Many thanks for your time today. Thanks, Ross. So that's it for the program this Sunday. Up next, all the latest news right here on Sky News. Business Weekend returns next Sunday, but don't forget you can keep up to date with all the latest business news with our daily program, Business Now, 4.30pm Eastern Summer Time. Thanks for your company today. I'm Ross Greenwood. We'll see you next week.